Amen. Wow, what a blessing. I invite you to, to open a Bible, to uh, open these books that contain God's Word, these books that contain life, these, these words that contain hope, and turn to the book of Revelation. This is going to be one of the easiest Sundays to find where I'm at. Go to the very, very last chapter of the book, Revelation chapter 22. Uh, we're going to hear about the end today. Uh, we've been uh, in a, a worship series called Trees of Life, and um, and so we, we talked about how the, the Bible in the, the very first three chapters of Genesis begins with this tree of life. And then uh, throughout other parts of the Bible, there's this tree of life that shows up that, that those who follow God are like trees planted by a river, that those who do the will and uh, live in these radical ways are like trees of life. And the Bible ends with a tree of life. And so read with me in Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. This is what it says there. John's having this vision, and he says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. <coughs> and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and His servants will serve Him. They will see God's face, and God's name will be on their foreheads be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to, to join me in prayer, if you would. <coughs> oh God, we ask you to be our vision. Oh God, help us to, to see with your eyes, to perceive the things that are beyond ourselves, to perceive the things that are beyond this world that we walk in. Oh God, speak into us in this time that we could have a fresh insight into this world, a fresh insight into our calling and a fresh insight into what you are asking us to do. God, teach us now the ways to live, the, the ways to life, the ways to be in that water of life. We give you this time and we ask you to speak, to touch and to move in the name of Jesus Christ. And all of God's people pray and together we say, amen, amen. So we are diving into the book of Revelation today and so if you're a little bit uh, coming at this with some trepidation or fear, I invite you to just... Hang with me a little bit. You'll be glad that you did. You know, a lot of people, when, when they look at the book of Revelation, they, they, they see it as kind of a road map. At Revelation, they, they, they view it as a way of, of recognizing exactly where we are within the course of human history, how close we are getting to the very end of time. You know, before maps was an app, there used to be these impossible to refold paper things. And back when my wife Michelle and I lived in Boston, we had this map of Boston that was literally bigger than my car. I only drove a Mitsubishi Eclipse, so it's not that impressive. But, but, but I, could, I could try to hold it with both hands, and I could not hold the map flat. It was that big. It was the whole city of Boston. And we carried it in my car because, well, frankly, we needed it. We, we really needed it because there's a few things I'd like you to know about Boston. First of all, nothing in Boston is gridded. Nothing. Nothing goes straight. And second of all, nothing in Boston runs north, south, east, west. Third of all, it wouldn't matter if it ran north, south, east, west because nobody in Boston knows which direction is north, south, east, or west. You can ask somebody, I just need to go north, and they'll be like, I, 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 don't, I don't have a clue. Fourth of all... We needed this map because in Boston, they have this bad tendency to not label streets, especially the major ones, because, well, everybody knows what street that is. 
And so Michelle and I would be driving around the city of Boston. We'd get ourselves lost, and we'd have to pull out this map because, frankly, we had, she's blocking about 85% of my view, and we have no idea where we are going. And that's how some people read the book of Revelation. They read Revelation as if it's this way of knowing where we are in relation to the final ending of the world. But if, my friends, if we read Revelation this way, it can seem like a really scary book. Because let's be honest, there are evil dragons and evil beasts. There are these seven scroll seals and seven trumpets and seven bowls. And any time a seal is broken or a, a trumpet is blown or a bowl is poured out, any time those things happen, there, there often come all these plagues and these disasters and these terrible things upon the earth and upon the people of the earth. And so, so it can be this very scary thing. But, but here's the truth. Revelation was not meant to be a road map. It was not meant to be a way to predict the end of time. If it was, then Jesus would not have said, about that day or hour, nobody knows. Not the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. If Revelation was meant to be a way where we could predict the end, then Jesus wouldn't have said that. Instead, Revelation is meant to be a holy book of hope. That's the purpose of Revelation. It's to give God's people hope in times of distress. Hope when things get bad. Hope when we are struggling with the struggles of life. You see, Revelation teaches us that, that there are two realities that we can live within. Two different realities. The, the first is a reality of suffering and pain. It's a, it's a reality where there's, there's division and divorce and death, where there's war and wailing, there's, there's persecution and plague, there, there's lament and loss, there's struggle and there's strife. It, it's the reality that often surrounds us. The, the reality of the world we live in, the, it's what we've always seen since the day we introduced that curse of sin into creation, into our world, and we spoiled that great garden that God planted. Now those things are going to come. They're going to happen in this world. They're, they're what the seals and the trumpets and the bowls describe, pain and, and suffering and plague. But Revelation says, wait, because there's another reality. Somebody say another reality. There's another reality, and, and that reality is what's described within those final chapters of Revelation. It's the reality where our God wins. It's the reality where, where evil is finally defeated. It's the reality where, where suffering is not just wasted, but suffering is redeemed. It's the reality where the brokenness of creation is finally healed. It's the reality where, where God himself steps in and wipes away every tear. It's the reality where there's a new heaven and a new earth. It's the reality where the presence of God is not merely off in heaven, but is here on earth with us. And Revelation says, my friends, we can live in the reality of, of sin and death and decay and plague as if that's all there is. Or we can, we, can, we can give in to those struggles. We can give up hope. We can live in that face of pain and we can accommodate evil and join the losing side. Or, or we can live within God's reality of hope where we already know the ending, where we participate ourselves in, in recreation where God wins. My friends, we can live within that reality right here and right now. Because God's already doing it. Now some of y'all might be saying, you might be saying, what in the world are you talking about? I'm already lost. I don't understand what you're saying. So let me, let me show you something. Let me show you something. If you, if you got your Bible there open, <coughs> look again at Revelation 22.2. It, it talks there about the leaves of this tree being for the healing of the nations. 
Now, now, if Revelation was merely a linear timeline with a, a beginning point and an end point and, and somewhere in between, if Revelation was strictly that linear timeline, then why would we need leaves to heal nations? Why would we need any leaves if, if God has already defeated evil, if God has already made all things new, if creation has already been set right and everybody is, is good and, and the evil have been, been punished and taken care of and chained up and locked away and thrown in the lake of fire, if all those things have already happened because they have already happened in the book of Revelation, then why do we need these leaves for the healing of the nations? The leaves for the healing of the nations only makes sense if this is an end of time reality that you and I can abide in today. This is a reality not only for, for what God is doing in the future, but, but it's, it's what God is bringing into our lives today as well. This is the message of revelation. The message of revelation is that, that things are bad sometimes. Yes, we are struggling. Yes, there's pain. Yes, we find ourselves in all these horrendous things and sometimes we're beat up just for being good, just for doing the right things. But, but the things might be bad, but don't give up. Don't give in to the ways of death. Don't pitch your tent and live there within those things because God is already making all things new. We may not be able to see it yet, but if we had that vision of God, we could see it. We can live in it, though. In fact, life is all over this scripture. There's the tree of life. There's a river of the water of life. Living in this reality is the way to have life. Does anybody need some life this morning? Okay, great. So how do we do that? Let's examine some of the imagery here in Revelation 22. First of all, <coughs> First of all, there's this river of life, this river of the water of life that's flowing from the throne of God down the middle of the great street of the city. And when I read that, I thought to myself, now, wait a minute, that's not very practical, is it? I mean, in fact, I'm pretty sure that the, the heavenly civil engineers are having a fit right now. I mean, why would God design a river of life to flow down this, the great street of the city? Here's what I think. A street can also be called a path or a way. In fact, the, the gospel writers, they play with that word a whole lot. If you, if you can read the Greek, you'd see how much they make a play on that word. The, the gospels actually, they talk one time about a blind man sitting alongside the street, alongside the way, and Jesus comes there in the way, and Jesus heals this blind man, and then after this man receives his sight, he follows in the way. Let me, let me say that again. So this man is sitting beside the way. He's not in the way. He's not on the way. He's sitting beside the way until Jesus shows up, until Jesus gives him this new sight, and then he follows in the way. And just to make it totally clear, it says in John 14, I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the path. I am this street. In other words, some might say that here in Revelation, we've combined the street, the way, with the river of life. In other words, if, if you want to discover this river of the water of life, we have to get in the way. I was out for an early morning run a few weeks ago, and I was running along this this great stream. I mean, you could hear it bubbling beside me and, and the water was crystal clear. It smelled fresh and cool and, and, and life-giving, but I ran a little further down and, and there was this pond. And this pond just looked like death. It was, it had this disgusting film on the top and kind of a green algae and, and slime and it stunk terribly. And you know, it was actually the very same water in that stream as in that pond, the very, the exact same water flowing in both of these bodies, but the only difference was, was the water that flowed out. You know, I mean, I thought somebody might get excited right there. Shoo! 
It's the same water going in. The only difference between the living water and the dead water is whether the water is flowing out. I wish somebody heard me today. I wish somebody knew what I was talking about today. You know, we, here's the deal. Here's, my, here's the deal. My friends, we can come into the church. We can get some Jesus in our life. We can, we can come and we can experience the goodness of God and have that water of life within us. We can come to church and get those great things, but if we aren't pouring that water out into somebody else, if we aren't sharing the good news of what God is doing, sharing living water with, with somebody else who needs it, then our water is going to stagnate. Our water is going to start to stink. If If we want that life within all the struggles of our lives, if we want that life, we have to be in the way. We have to receive the water and then let it pour out through us to others as well. So there's this river of the water of life and then there's this, this great tree of life. And it's growing on both sides of the river. And again, again, that's kind of weird, isn't it? I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of rivers in my day and I've seen a lot of trees on my bank of the river, and I've seen a lot of trees that were on the other side, on the other bank of the river, but, but I've never seen a tree that stands on both banks of the river. But this tree, this tree isn't an either or. It's not a tree that, that belongs to one side and not the other. No, there's, there's access to this tree no matter who we are, no matter where we come from. It doesn't matter which side of the tracks you live on. It, it doesn't matter which group you're a part of. It doesn't matter what your beliefs are. This tree stretches across those things that seek to divide us. This is the kingdom of God. In fact, it explicitly says that, that the leaves of this tree are for the healing of the nations. It's for the healing of those divisions. It's for the healing of those things that, that have sought to separate us for all of our lives. And then finally, Revelation says that the throne of God and the Lamb, they will be in the city and his servants will serve him. And anytime the Bible says servants, you can substitute the word slaves there because that's the meaning of the word. Modern, modern translators, we like to soften it just a little bit, but the word is slaves. God's slaves will serve him. And personally, I don't like that a whole lot. Maybe it's the American in me, but I want my freedom. I, I don't want anybody telling me what to do. I, I don't want anybody uh, dictating my life. I don't want to be anybody's slave. But I wonder if we really understood God, if we really understood that God doesn't force people into submission, that God doesn't rule with an iron fist and punish when we go astray and, and harm and hurt. If, God, if we understood that God doesn't hold us against our will, but instead that, that God leads those who totally place their lives into God's hands, that God leads them to rivers of life, to trees of life, that God provides fruit in every season of every year. If we really understood that we have a master that wants to take us to places that are better than we can take ourselves, then maybe it wouldn't seem quite so bad. And maybe, just maybe that would heal the problems in our world. <laughs> I've got a roof over my head I've got a warm place to sleep Some nights I lie awake Counting gifts Instead of counting sheep I've got a heart that can hold love I've got a mind that can think There may be times when I lose the light and let my spirit sink but I can't stay depressed 
When I remember how I'm blessed Grateful, grateful, truly grateful I am Grateful, grateful, truly blessed and duly grateful In a city of strangers I've got a family of friends No matter what rocks and brambles fill the way I know that they will stay until the end I feel a hand holding my hand It's not a hand you can see But on the road to the promised land This hand will shepherd me through delight and despair Holding tight and always there Grateful, grateful, truly grateful I am Grateful, grateful, truly blessed and duly grateful It's not that I don't want a lot Or hope for more Or dream of more But giving thanks for what I've got Makes me so much happier Than keeping score In a world that can bring pain I will still take each chance For I believe that whatever the terrain Our feet can learn to dance Whatever stone life may sling We can moan or we can sing Grateful, grateful Truly grateful I am Grateful, grateful Truly blessed And duly grateful Truly blessed And duly grateful Amen.